It's been a while since we've done any kind of question and answer video, so I polled the channel members and the Patreon patrons to see what their questions might be, and hopefully everybody will benefit from the answers. Tobias asks, I'm really interested in all things practical and how you use charcoal for your main forage fuel. Well, the truth is, I like the idea of using charcoal, but it is not my main forage fuel. I primarily use propane. My second most used forge is the induction forge, which of course is electric, and then the solid fuel forge. And I like using charcoal in the solid fuel forge because it doesn't smoke, it smells good. It's a fuel that I can produce right here with materials that I have on my property. Now that doesn't apply to everybody, but it's nice when you have the stuff available if you can make use of it. Unfortunately, making charcoal is rather labor intensive, and the time that it takes to make charcoal is time that I could spend forging, so I really don't make it as often as I should. One of these days, I'm gonna make a great big charcoal kiln. I've got an old 500 gallon propane tank I'm gonna cut up to do that with, and that should be much higher production. Maybe one batch of charcoal in that would be a month's worth of fuel, and then I probably will burn charcoal more. And I'm hoping one of these days to do a comparison of coal, coke, and charcoal just to see what the different factors are. But charcoal produces a lot more ash, and because it's light, it's easy to blow out of the fire pot. So I think a side blast forge would be the ideal for that. And if I ever convert to charcoal as my primary solid fuel when using the solid fuel forge, I will probably build a side blast forge just for that reason. Kenny Kaler would like to know what some reliable steel sources are. Well, mild steel, which is what I use the vast majority of the time, I buy from a local supplier. Most big cities will have some form of steel supplier. When I lived in Denver, there were probably a dozen or more steel warehouses I could go to to buy materials. Here in Pueblo, there's really only one, but it still has everything I need and they can order what I don't need for mild steel, and that's construction type material. And that's who these places usually deal with is the construction industry, welding shops, things like that. If you don't have one in your city, you might be able to get on a delivery route for one of these places because they have trucks that go all over the place to deliver to smaller shops. Check with a local welding shop to see where they get their materials and you might be able to get on that same delivery route. Buying from the home center and the three or four foot pieces that they sell there is probably the least cost effective way to buy materials. It's outrageously priced. Way better to buy 20 foot sticks from a real steel supplier. As far as tool steels go, I buy a lot of stuff from McMaster Car because they're reliable and I buy tools and other supplies from them, so it's just easy for me to add the tool steel to that. But New Jersey Steel Baron has stuff. A lot of the knife making suppliers also sell various knife specific tool steels. And there's some other online sources if you just search for tool steels or search for the specific steel you're looking for, you'll probably find a source. But I do have pretty good luck with McMaster Car for 4140, 5160, S7, W1, all that stuff that's pretty common steel for blacksmiths to use, I can get from McMaster Car. Probably a little bit more expensive, but like I say, it's reliable. Kirkos, I'm probably re mispronouncing that name, sorry, says, I'd be curious to hear what you think about the future of blacksmithing will be. Are we seeing a genuine return to the artisan ways? Will new technologies like the induction forge bring new people in? I think in some sense we are, although it's hard to say for sure. I certainly see more blacksmiths every day. I see more interesting work, more advanced work being done. But that may be skewed a little bit because the internet makes it so much easier to find all this stuff. So I have a much broader selection of things to look at when I was looking on the internet to find things. So my perception is there are more people participating, more people trying more advanced work, more people getting away from just making trinkets. But like I say, that may be skewed a little bit. I would like to think that's it. I see more and more younger smiths. I get more questions from younger smiths all the time. I'm seeing more young smiths starting YouTube channels because they're trying to get themselves out there and get noticed. So I really have a hope that blacksmithing is seeing a big renaissance. And traditional technique is seeing a renaissance with it. More people learning to forge weld. And it's those of us who are actually active in the craft of blacksmithing that need to encourage the next generation to pick up a hammer and try it out for themselves. Michael would like to know what type of metalwork I find most rewarding. I do like making tools, but my tastes change from time to time. At one time, I thought I was just gonna be a knife maker. 
Then I started doing things for reenactors and thought that's what all I'm ever going to do. I'm just going to do more things for reenactors and do fancier, more detailed work for that. And then I got out of that and was doing woodworking tools. Now I'm starting to look more into more ornamental work, doing some grill work, things like that. So my tastes change. And the thing that I like most about blacksmithing is there's a lot of different variety and I can explore these different changes in tastes without having to start a whole new craft. The tools I have suit different types of work. And of course, I can make tools that I need for specific projects. One of the things I really want to do in the near future is learn to make locks. I've mentioned that before. It's just something that I have a feeling is going to be two, three months just to get the very basics to the point that I can even make a video. And that means two or three months, I'm not sure what I do for video. So I keep putting it off to make more blacksmithing videos. But one of these days, I'll get back to that. And of course, I still want to make all the tools in the master mirror chest. I think that would be a whole lot of fun to do, along with the chest as well. Daniel would like to know what hammer gripping technique I use to avoid fatigue. The big thing is to have a hammer that's comfortable for you to swing. Too heavy a hammer is going to cause problems. Too long a handle might cause problems. Too tight a grip is going to cause problems. If you can keep a loose grip so that you're not really squeezing hard and a death grip on this thing, it's going to be a lot easier on your elbows and your shoulders, your wrists. And that really does mean a handle that fits your hand. So if you've got too big a handle and you've got to really grip it, or too small a handle and you've got to grip it tight to keep it from slipping out, modify the handle, replace the handle, do what you need to do. But also don't try to swing too heavy a hammer. There are people out there that swing six, seven pound hammers all the time. And if they can do that without hurting themselves, that's fine, that's their business. Me, I don't want to swing a hammer more than about three pounds all day long, and a lot of times a two, two and a half pound hammer is much better suited for what I'm doing. So get a hammer that you're comfortable swinging and work up to a heavier hammer. Don't start with a heavy hammer and hope for the best. Tendonitis can take months to heal, and it's going to keep you out of the shop for most of that time. Hayden wants to know, how do you go about finding people to buy what you make? Well, the internet is a great place these days. If you can build an audience on the internet, that's where you're going to find a much broader variety. But if you don't have a website, you don't have a big social media presence, or you're just trying to build that, you might start off at local craft shows, art shows, things like that. And if your work is very specific, very targeted, try to find shows that appeal to that audience. Going to the local Christmas craft show to sell $500 knives probably isn't going to get you any sales. But you might sell a lot of hooks, fireplace pokers, things like that at a craft show like that. Etsy isn't bad, but it can be kind of hit and miss, and I don't know really what the big success on Etsy is. I think I do well on Etsy because of the YouTube channel here, because I have a large Instagram following, and that brings people to my Etsy shop. I don't think Etsy by itself just generate sales. It can. you got to be bringing the people to Etsy from somewhere else. So an internet presence, places like Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, even TikTok, probably helps if you're trying to succeed in selling things online, whether that's Etsy or your own website. The first place I used, sold things was at Mountain Man Rendezvous, and I was making things for the rendezvous, for the reenactment crowd. So that was a perfect match. I'd make the things, I'd take it there. I didn't need to worry about a website or any of that. Of course, at that time, the internet was so new, I would have known how to do that. That's something that's evolved over the years. But if you don't have that direct outlet, I think internet is still the way to go. Colvin asks, what are the local national smithing organizations like Rocky Mountain Smiths and Abana? Rocky Mountain Smiths is our local one. It's a kind of a three or four state group. In fact, we even have some international members. And Abana is the national group in the United States. Canada's got a group. England has a group. I think Australia has a group. And a lot of other countries have national groups. And these national groups usually then have smaller local and regional groups. So Abana, the Artist Blacksmithing Association of North America, has affiliate groups. Rocky Mountain Smiths is one of those affiliate groups. And Abana has groups all over the country. There's groups in California, New York, Texas. You might have to travel to hook up with some of these groups, but it's generally worth it. And a lot of them will have a place that you can camp or you can get a hotel for the night, spend the day at the demo, get to know people. And that's really going to jumpstart your blacksmithing if you can get involved with one of these groups. So it's worth tracking them down wherever you live. 
Robert asks, any trips for forge welding dissimilar metals, carbon steels and high carbon bits to mild steel axe heads? The biggest trick is don't overheat it. The carbon steel is going to weld at a lower temperature than the mild steel is. So if you're inserting the bit, the mild steel on the outside is actually going to heat up faster and get a little bit hotter than the carbon steel on the inside. That's to your benefit in that situation. But there's a crossover there where both of them are at welding heat at the same time. Overheating that carbon steel bit, it just turns to mush, even though the mild steel is at welding temp. So there's just that fine line, it may be a few hundred degrees that crosses over and you can weld. Experiment with different steels. I've had nothing but trouble trying to use 01 as the carbon steel component and axes, adds as things like that, but I've had very good luck with 5160. Other people say they can never weld 5160s, so it's just up to what experience you have and practice, practice, practice. That's always the best technique. Peter would like to know about estimating materials. Boy, that would be the subject for a whole series of videos, and I have to admit, I am a lousy mathematician. I'm terrible at estimating. I use kind of a seat of the pants method for a lot of things just based on experience. And that's really the thing to do is get the experience, draw tapers out, mark your bar first, see how long it stretches. Do a two-sided taper, do a four-sided square taper, do a round taper. How long does the bar stretch with each of those? Make middle notes, write it on the wall, keep a notebook, whatever you need to do so you know what's gonna happen when you do that type of a procedure. You'll start to develop a little intuition on what's gonna happen with that stuff. And when you're doing big projects, measure it out, use the rules of thumb you've developed by doing these practice pieces, do a practice piece, figure out what really happens on that piece, make your cut list accordingly, and then forge it to fit what you need. There are lots of ways to estimate volumes for big three-dimensional items by using water displacement and weights and all sorts of stuff. And I don't really get into that. I don't take that precise an approach to most of my blacksmithing. I really like a little bit more freedom in the things I'm forging. Although if you're doing big architectural pieces that have to fit, you need to make sure you get those dimensions right. And test pieces are really the key for a lot of that stuff. And, and of course, familiarize yourself with when to use pi for figuring out circles, areas of circles, circumferences, things like that. And when doing most of that stuff, you're measuring from the center line of the bar, bend this bar this way, and you need to know how much material measure from the center line. Half of that bar is going to compress a little bit, half of it's gonna stretch. The center line is gonna be the most accurate. So you need to work from the center of bars for most of your measurements. Rudolph would like to know about forging a hex end on a bar. That's a tough process. I've never done it really well. Some of these questions I think are gonna be good video material. So I think this is one I'm gonna try and do for a video and see if I can make that make more sense. How to explain it just talking to the camera, I can't really think of right now. So I'll get back to that, put that on my list of videos to do. How much borax should you use while fluxing? Well, most of us use way too much. It doesn't take much. It really wicks into the joint. Borax wicks in more than some of the other fluxes do. So if you've got a big joint that you can't get in there before you flux it, borax is a good flux for that. For little welds and drop tongs type welds, I prefer Easy Weld, Iron Mountain Flux, one of those other fluxes that don't penetrate as well, but they aren't as slippery. Borax is a slippery flux, and it makes things kind of slimy. So if you've got two pieces that are captive, like a fro where I've wrapped an eye, and that eye's not going to move, borax is a good flux. But a drop tongs weld, like you're welding the reins on a set of tongs, the borax will make those pieces squirt apart with the first hammer blow instead of catching the weld with the first hammer blow. So for those, I like something like Easy Weld or the Iron Mountain Flux. And I did do a video on how much flux and kind of showed the effects of more or less flux. And I will see if I can find that and link to that video right up here. Kyle would like to know if I have any tricks or tips in welding 4140 to 4140. I'm not sure I've ever tried to do that. Usually when I'm doing forge welding, it's either mild to mild or mild to a tool steel. I'm not usually trying to weld tool steels to tool steels. That's not something I do a lot of. If it doesn't work, maybe a little higher heat, make sure your surfaces are clean. If you get to the point that it's falling apart, your heat's probably too high. 
but I'm not sure if there's any trick in 4140. It's really not something I've ever done much welding. I think I did one axe that had a 4140 body and I was just gonna make the whole axe 4140, but I was in the habit of slitting it and putting a bit in. But once I realized I would, had slit the 4140, I just went ahead and put a 5160 bit in it. it. Seemed to work fine, but those are also dissimilar. So I don't know if there's a trick to welding 4140 to 4140 or not. Vita Moretta, again, I'm probably mispronouncing that name, I'd like to know what I've done about radiusing the new Fontanini anvil. That's something I'm still waiting to do. I'm getting a real good idea for where I want radiuses and how much radius I want but I didn't want to go after it too soon for fear that I would take too much off and regret it. So I'm going to be adding different radiuses to different parts of the anvil, so when you need a radius, you just have to find the right one. But it, none of it's going to be too dramatic. If I need a dramatic radius, I'll get a fuller, do something else. But the edges that come on it are a little bit sharp, and they do need to be radiused somewhat. Boy, a lot of these names I can't pronounce. I'm terrible. Sorry about that. When working the end of bar stock, how do you prevent the edges of a piece from forming a crater at the end? People call this fish lips. Sometimes that's to your benefit if you're making an eyeball punch or a rivet set or something and you need a depression. But the biggest thing is to maybe dub back the end of the bar and bevel it before you start drawing it out. Make sure it's hot. Hot bar, you'll get more effect down into the center of the bar, so it'll push the center of the bar out more. If the bar is kind of cold, you're just going to be forging the ends. Also, start back a little bit from the end so that you're kind of pushing that bar out before you get right to the edges of it. Bryson has two questions. What do you know now about smithing you wish you knew when you started? Boy, that's a good question. Really, I think the big thing is to get involved with other blacksmiths. We've talked about this already. It's fine people that are doing it. Reading books is great. Watching YouTube videos is something I didn't have available back when I started. But actually working with other people, being able to talk one-on-one -on -one with them, seeing what they're doing, looking at their tools, seeing how their shop's set up, that really jumpstarts you as a blacksmith, and that can really help you out. When you start, you don't know what a proper forging heat is. You're either working material too cold or you're overheating it and burning it and ruining it, and you don't know why things aren't coming out right. So having help is probably the number one thing, and I resisted that as a young smith because I was self-conscious and I didn't want to get out there and embarrass myself. The thing I wish I'd known is that most of those people really do want to help out, and don't worry about embarrassing yourself. The second question, what technique do you use regularly that you didn't when you got started? I suppose that's probably forge welding. Uh, most people don't really like forge welding when they start. They think it's some arcane secret, it's a mystery that they're not gonna be able to accomplish. So people avoid forge welding and I was no different. I didn't know how to forge weld and it was a long time. I tried, I practiced, I tried it and it wasn't until I worked with somebody else that knew how to forge weld and could watch over my shoulder and say that's not hot enough or that's too hot or your scarf isn't prepared properly. That's the key to forge welding and once you learn to forge weld and can incorporate it more into your daily work it really opens some doors for you. So I think that's probably a technique I didn't use much when I started and that I use a lot now. And of course I use bigger tooling now than I used when I started, both to reduce the wear and tear on my body and because it's a lot more efficient. And as you grow and as you acquire more tools, you'll acquire some bigger tools eventually. Ken says he has a one inch pry bar that needs to be longer and he wants to know the best connection method to forge weld two pieces that big. I think a cleft weld, where you put a bird's mouth on one end and a point on the other end so they go together, kind of like welding the bit in an ax or an adze, something like that, is probably the best one, probably gonna be the strongest. Don't know, I've never really tried that. That's not a weld that I've worked with a lot. So that sounds like another thing that would make a good video just to experiment with that welding technique to make a bar longer. Chris wants to know, besides your power hammer, what's the biggest time-saving tool? Boy, that's hard to say. All of the tools can save time. I'm gonna guess the gas forge is probably the biggest time saver. Being able to put multiple bars in without fear of burning them up and work on one bar, you go back to the forge, the next one's hot, that really saves a lot of time. That's really efficient for production work. 
It isn't the best for ornamental work. I think a coal forge, coke, charcoal, something like that is often better for the ornamental work because it's more versatile. You can get round things and other odd shapes into the fire where you need to, where often that doesn't fit back into the gas forge. But for doing a lot of the production work, froze, holdfasts, hinges, things like that, the gas forge really saves a lot of time, and probably more so than the power hammer does. Another thing that saves a lot of time isn't a tool in the shop, but it's just the internet in general, the ability to go look for a supply material, an answer to a question you have, and find it quickly and easily saves all sorts of time. You can order materials, supplies, have them delivered, and be back in the shop without having to worry about running to town. Now, if you live someplace where that stuff's just 10 minutes down the road, that's great, but most of us don't, and most of us need to order stuff, so the internet can be a real time saver. I actually think we got through all those questions. It's probably a longer video than I meant for it to be. Be safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next video.